Good morning, staff and students. As we begin the remembrance ceremony, we acknowledge the traditional territory of the Sawasan and Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, and of all the Coast Salish peoples who have been stewards of the land we live, work, and play on since time immemorial. We also wish to extend our acknowledgement beyond the Lower Mainland of British Columbia to offer respect and gratitude for the contributions Indigenous veterans have made to Canada and the world. This morning, we commemorate Remembrance Day with a special memorial service for the Canadians who lost their lives in the fight for freedom and peace. In our nation's capital, Ottawa, Ontario, along Wellington Street in front of the Parliament buildings is the National War Memorial. Within that National Memorial lies the tomb of a Canadian soldier known only as the Unknown Soldier. Other nations have similar tombs to honour the sacrifices of soldiers that never made it home, but Canada only established such a tomb in the year 2000 at the request of Canadian war veterans who felt that new generations of Canadians should have the causes and consequences of war brought home to them. In war, the devastation caused is terrible, both to landscape and living beings. When soldiers are killed, their remains may be badly damaged or even completely destroyed. Although soldiers wear identity tags to assist in their identification, the destruction caused by exploding shells and other war influences can result in the identity tags no longer being with a soldier's remains. When the First World War ended, a great effort was made to find and identify the remains of those killed on the battlefield. Inevitably, many could only be identified by indicators, such as buttons or badges. Those identified only as Canadians were buried under a gravestone stating, a Canadian soldier of the Great War, known unto God. In Canada, we take time every year to dutifully attempt to acknowledge the sacrifices made by Canadians for the freedom we often obliviously take for granted today. As we do this on an annual basis, many of us believe that we have a fairly good idea of what a Canadian soldier is, what they look like, and how they sacrifice for our freedom. While we will never disparage the memory of Canadian soldiers we know, remember, or imagine on Remembrance Day, in today's ceremony, we wish to commemorate the soldiers of Canada that are perhaps the unknown soldiers. When Canada became engaged in the First World War, a call went out for soldiers, and Canadians from all across the country answered the call. Canada was still in its infancy as a nation, and now we know it was rife with social injustices. Despite the lack of equality, volunteers from many ethnic minorities also stood up to be counted among the volunteers for what would become the Canadian Armed Forces. Even though they wanted to join the war effort, many were turned away at first and were not welcomed until they were needed. Many volunteered in the hopes that if they showed up for Canada, Canada would show up for them. Canada became engaged in the war when Britain declared war on Germany in August of 1914. As the Dominion of Canada had previously been a collection of British colonies that only recently been granted nation status from the British Crown, 
It is understandable that a large majority of volunteers for the Canadian military were of Anglo-Saxon descent. It should be remembered, however, that among the volunteers were Canadians of African, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, and First Nations descent. These volunteers sacrificed themselves for Canada, even though they were not afforded the same freedoms or social status as the Anglo-Saxon soldiers they fought alongside. Many were not even eligible for citizenship and therefore fought for Canada without even being Canadian. began in the same year as the Komagata Maru incident in Burrard Inlet. Even with all of the prejudice against South Asian immigration in Canada at the time, 10 men from India enlisted in the Canadian Army. They were not citizens, and most of them had previous military experience from India prior to immigration. When the war broke out, they answered the call. Due to inconsistencies of records kept at the time, very little is known about these men. One in particular was a man born in Punjab who immigrated to Canada in 1907. His name was Book Am um, Singh. He enlisted in 1915 at age 22. Although no one knows why he enlisted, he and uh, the other nine Indo-Canadians were placed in units alongside white soldiers. These men would have gone to basic training and would have been surrounded by the English language. There's no evidence that these 10 men served together. Book Am um, Singh arrived in Belgium in 1916 and remained in Europe until two separate injuries earned him passage back to Canada. While in Europe, he was treated at a field hospital run by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, who wrote In Flanders Fields. Upon returning to Canada, while recovering from his injuries, he passed away from tuberculosis in 1919 at the age of 25. Book Am Singh was buried in the Mount Hope Cemetery in Kitchener. His is the only known gravesite of an Indo-Canadian soldier who served in World War I. Two of the ten never returned from Europe, and the whereabouts of their remains are unknown to this day. Like so many others swept up in the excitement and patriotism that the First World War initially brought on, young black Canadians were eager to serve their country. There were unfortunate racial barriers in place that made enlistment difficult for black Canadians, but they managed to find ways to join anyhow. The military created a segregated unit known as the Number no. 2 Construction Battalion. This battalion served in a non-combat support role and was created on the pretense that it would only be established if enough black Canadians would volunteer. Even with a dedicated and segregated unit, there were several black Canadians that managed to serve in combat positions within combat battalions. No fewer than 20 black Canadian soldiers fought in the Battle of Vimy Ridge, including Private Frederick Walter Firth. Private Firth's body was never recovered, and thus his name is commemorated on the Vimy Memorial in France. In all, more than 1,000 black Canadians served. For many, the conditions under which they served were not glamorous. At the end of the war, these men were not given the same hero's welcome as their white counterparts, and it would take decades before they would be recognized for their heroism, bravery, and contributions to the Canadian war effort. The legacy of Japanese Canadian soldiers in the First World War is significant. There were 228 Japanese Canadian soldiers that served for the Canadian military. 92 were wounded and another 54 never returned to Canada. One of the lucky ones that were able to return was Sergeant Masumi Mitsui. Mitsui was born in Tokyo and immigrated to British Columbia in 1901. He fought bravely in several battles and was one of the two Japanese Canadians to be awarded with service medals in the First World War. Upon returning home, he used his military experience to lobby for the Japanese Canadian vote, and for his efforts, the Japanese Canadians were enfranchised in BC in 1931. Sadly, 10 years later, after the bombing of the Pearl Harbor, Mitsui, along with 22,000 other Japanese Canadians, was moved inland to serve out in the Second World War in an internment camp. While being registered as an enemy alien, Mitsui reportedly pulled out his war medals and threw them on the table, asking, what are the good of my medals? Following the war, Mitsui moved to Ontario, 
but was invited back to Vancouver in 1985, at age 98, to reignite the torch at the Japanese-Canadian War Memorial in Stanley Park that had been extinguished in 1942. Born to Chinese parents in Kamloops, BC, Frederick Lee was among 300 soldiers of Chinese descent who enlisted in the Canadian Expeditionary Force in World War I. Lee was known to be a skilled machine gunner who survived the Battle of Vimy Ridge, but was killed at the Battle of Hill 70. He has no known grave. Chinese Canadian soldiers that were lucky enough to return to Canada faced terrible discrimination, including the passage of the Chinese Immigration Act of 1923 which banned any further Chinese immigration to Canada. Even with this discriminatory policy in place, more than 600 Chinese Canadians would volunteer to serve in the Canadian military in the Second World War. With so many contributions and sacrifices made by the Chinese Canadian community, the government finally repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1947. That same year, the first Canadian citizenship ceremony for Chinese immigrants was held in Vancouver. More than 4,000 First Nations soldiers fought for Canada during the war, officially recorded by the Department of Indian Affairs, and likely thousands more non-status Indians, Inuit, and Métis soldiers enlisted without official recognition of their Indigenous identity. As Canada continues on the path of truth and reconciliation, we are collectively becoming more and more aware of the horrific injustices against Indigenous Canadians. And yet these people volunteered in large numbers to fight for a country that largely viewed them as a burden on society. More than 50 indigenous soldiers were decorated for bravery in action, including the Anishinaabe soldier, Francis Pegamagabo. Francis grew up in Shawanaga and was raised in the traditions of Anishinaabe. He was taught to hunt and to fish and was introduced to traditional medicine. Francis was one of the first to enlist in 1914 and was in France by February of 1915. Francis held on to his cultural traditions while in combat. Prior to going overseas, an elder gave him a tiny medicine bag to protect him, saying he would shortly go into great danger. Francis later recalled that sometimes the medicine bag was as hard as rock and at other times it appeared to contain nothing. What was really inside, I do not know. I wore it in the trenches. Over the course of war, he was credited with the capture of approximately 300 prisoners. At the end of the war, Francis had become one of the most highly decorated indigenous soldiers in Canadian military history. Francis Pegamagabo was awarded the military medal and earned two bars. He was also awarded a 1914 to 1915 star, the British War Medal, and the Victory Medal. Francis did not return to Canada as a war hero. As an Indigenous man, Francis returned to Canada only to face the same persecution and poverty that he had experienced before the war. He went on to become chief of the Wasaxing First Nation and spent the rest of his life lobbying for better treatment for Indigenous peoples. I don't know if God lives in a temple or church, in a synagogue, cathedral, or mosque. In my heart I feel God's existence is real by his love for the child that is lost. Mortars rain down on village and town, assault troops then even the score. Not many survive, one or two are alive. Those we orphans, the children of war. Again and again, brave Canadian men gather up those who remain, take them to the rear, away from the fear, from the death, the suffering, the pain. From a bombed out shack, its door burned black, came a wailing, crying sound. By a wall made of sod was a wee child of God. A miracle baby was found. In the midst of the smoke, tough peacekeepers joke, whilst holding back tears, rage, and fear, and in the canteen, those things that they have seen are flashback or pictures of beer. <laughs> 
I can't say if God lives in a temple or church, in a synagogue, cathedral, or mosque, but he lives in the foxhole, the bunker, the trench, good shepherd to the child that is lost. Canada has a legacy of soldiers, many of whom remain unknown. The Canadian government made a special request to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission to select one grave from among the 1,603 unknown Canadians whose graves are located in the vicinity of Vimy Ridge. Remains were exhumed on Tuesday morning, May 16th, 2000, from Cabaret Rouge British Cemetery, Suchet, Plot 8, Row E, Grave 7. We do not know his age, or the unit he fought with, or the date of his death. No one does for the nearly 117,000 Canadians who have died in all wars since the birth of our country. A total of the unknown soldier is among the 28,000 that are unable to be identified or have no known grave. Maybe the tomb belongs to an Indo-Canadian soldier. Perhaps Private Frederick Walter Firth, Frederick Lee, or one of the many Japanese or indigenous Canadians that paid the ultimate sacrifice during the First World War. Why must we remember? As Canadians, we often take for granted our current way of life. Our freedom to participate in cultural and political events and our right to live under democratically elected government. We have a constitution with a charter which ensures all Canadians enjoy protection under the law. The many Canadians who went off to war went in the belief that such rights and freedoms were being threatened. They believed that without freedom, there can be no enduring peace. And without peace, no enduring freedom. Please stand for the last post, followed by a minute of silence. The moment of silence will end when you hear the bugler play Reveille. Thank you. 
we must remember. If we do not, the sacrifice of those thousands of Canadian lives will be meaningless. They died for us, for their homes and families and friends, for a collection of traditions they cherished and the future they believed in. Their sacrifice rests with our collective national consciousness. Our future is their monument. On November 11th, please take time to remember our veterans of war and peacekeeping. This concludes our ceremony.